Welcome to the Faith and Culture series, Christianity and American Politics by Bridgeway Christian Church. This series comes in 2024, a presidential election year in the United States. If recent election cycles have anything to tell us, it's that we can expect this year to be filled with campaigns, rallies, anxiety, conflict, misinformation, and many other dynamics that arise during a season of heightened political activity. Recent U.S. election cycles have also demonstrated how the American church has to a large degree pursued a mission of national formation through political power. While we encourage political involvement by Christians, it is our conviction that the church is losing its way and its witness and desperately needs to be called back to its primary mission as disciples and disciple makers of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, we are not alone in recognizing the urgency of this call. With this series, Bridgeway joins many other voices within the church who are rising up to speak truthfully and soberly to the present moment. So what can you expect from this series? First, I'd like to share three points about what this series is. First, this series establishes a foundational biblical framework by which Christians at Bridgeway would engage politically. Second, this series seeks to hold Christians accountable to think and behave like Christ in the political arena. And third, this series is about applying godly wisdom to the sifting and sorting of complex information. We should also be clear on what this series is not. This series does not advocate for a political party or a side. We do not lobby for a particular candidate or tell you how to vote on a specific issue. We are not interested in needlessly stirring the pot and adding angst to political conversation. We are not interested in secretly advancing a political agenda. And we don't presume that our contribution is the final say on the subject. Now, this series is presented over the course of four sessions. Session one addresses the primary importance of Christian formation and identity and what this means for a Christian posture toward political engagement. Session two provides important context for the present moment by surveying the long history of church and state's interaction. Session three draws out meaning from our historical survey and lays a foundation for being a responsible Christian citizen today. And session four presents tools and a framework for navigating politics day-to-day in America. Now, each session includes a presentation by pastors Lance Hahn and Brian Kiley, followed by a time of Q&A from the audience. Now, as you watch the series, we have a few thoughts and hopes for you in mind. First, we know that politics can be a very emotional subject. We get it. It's complex, and political decisions affect lives. Passion is inevitable and can even be good. In fact, you will hear impassioned discussions throughout this series. But we also hope that you will hear the passion as genuine care and concern for the church. Secondly, it's completely okay to hold a different perspective than what is shared. But we hope that you will give a full and fair hearing to the many points presented. And finally, because this series is part of an ongoing conversation by Christians with Christians about political matters, we hope that Christians watching are inspired to reflect the way of Jesus in 2024 and beyond. Thank you for watching. Well, hey, everybody. How are we doing? It is great to see you. Thank you so much again for coming out. Uh, We're going to dive right in. So we learned last week that we cannot just throw our hands up and quit, although some of us might be tempted to. God has us here for a reason, and he's here for a purpose. And part of what we want to do as followers of Christ is to affect positive change 
in the world. Uh, We can't just stuff our beliefs. We can't just abdicate responsibility. So tonight, we are going to try to get practical with answering some practical questions about politics, political engagement, news, that sort of thing. So uh, my topics for the next 35 minutes are how to have a healthy media diet, how to have better political conversations, and biblical principles we can use to guide political decisions. 35 minutes. Here we go. So let's talk about news media. I love the news media. I spent most of my uh, childhood, this is a little weird, but most of my childhood wanting to go into news media. So I have been uh, somebody who enjoys uh, the the process of kind of formulating and writing stories uh, my entire life. And we would all love to find the news store and the news source that is entirely unbiased and gives us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Um, But news sources like that are as real as unicorns. Sorry if I just bursted your bubble about unicorns. Uh, no media source is totally objective, but, but guess what? Neither are we. We've talked about this during the series. But where we get our news matters. I saw a poll recently uh, that said for Gen Z, 61% of them get political news from YouTube, followed by 57% from TikTok, 51% from Instagram, Uh, with Snapchat, Twitter, and Facebook all coming in above 33%. Those, of course, all being platforms that are known for carefully curated, thoughtful, sober-minded reflections on the issues of the day. But are other generations all that much better? In his extraordinary book, Losing Our Religion, an Altar Call for Evangelical America, Russell Moore, who spent a lot of his time speaking and lecturing on, on college campuses and in church settings, shares about how for most of his career, it was not at all uncommon for older adults to come up to him very, very concerned about their wayward young adult children. My children are not showing interest in the Lord. My children have gone to college and lost their faith, et cetera. And he would counsel them on how to approach those situations. But what he's found as he's traveled the country in the last several years is he's finding less of that. And it's now much more common for him to have Christians in their 20s and 30s approaching him for advice, saying, what do I do? My parents have been radicalized by cable news. So let's not not pretend that Gen Z is unique in some unhealthy news habits. Where we get our news matters. So I want to give you some principles for for a healthier media diet. And I'm going to divide my remarks on this topic into two categories, personal and practical. Because there are some personal things we need to deal with if we're going to engage with the news media in a healthy way that no news source can solve if we don't do that work. So the first is to know thyself. You must know yourself. Every human being has biases, tendencies, and preferences. And that's not bad, but it can cause problems when we are unaware of them, right? The psychological principle of confirmation bias teaches us that we are much more likely to accept that which we already believe. Uh, Not only that, we are more likely to seek out information that confirms our beliefs, and we are likely to interpret ambiguous data in a manner that, you guessed it, reaffirms what we already believe. Julia Galef, a, a writer, urges us to have what she calls a scout mindset. That is defined as, quote, the motivation to see things as they are not as you wish they were. It is what allows you to recognize when you are wrong, to seek your blind spots, and to test your assumptions and change course. Now, there is one very powerful practice that can help us to do this, and I want to illustrate it with a story. When I was growing up, my parents held these gatherings before every major election that they called voter parties. And this is how these parties would work they would invite all of their friends to come over to their house for an evening, and every person in attendance prepared a short presentation, either for or against a ballot measure, or for a candidate who is going to be on the ballot. And the purpose behind the party was for all of them to be able to kind of familiarize themselves with the issues coming up on, uh, on the ballot in a moderately social setting. Now, you're probably thinking two things. Number one, I don't think your parents know the definition of the word party. <laughs> Number two, how many fistfights broke out? 
and, and number one, you're, you're absolutely correct. Uh, number two, uh, zero. Zero fistfights broke out. Now, this was the early 90s, so if you wanted to get radicalized by misinformation, you like, really had to work at it. So it was a little bit, t- things were a little more civil back then. But I remember to this day, the dad of one of my friends, who was a repeat attender at these parties, and he told me once during one of the breaks where I put down my video games and just came out for the snacks, no 12-year-old me was not listening to the pros and cons of Prop 47. He, would t- he told me that every time he comes to the party, he actually selects to give a presentation on the opposite of his own point of view. So if he's in favor of Prop 47, he actually takes the con for Prop 4. I'm just making up the number 47. I don't know what that is. He would actually try to argue against it. And if you're cynical like me, you might be saying, and he, yeah, he'd probably give a really lame presentation. So in conclusion, this proposition is bad because you'll get lots of free money. Like, but that's not what he did. He actually did his best to give as thorough of a persuasive presentation as he could. He wanted to go through the intellectual exercise of trying to understand and defend a perspective other than his own. And that stayed with me my entire life, to the point where you talk about any of my serious political convictions that matter to me, or any of my serious theological convictions that matter to me, I feel very confident I could argue persuasively for the other side. And I would go so far as to say, if you can't argue against your own beliefs, you probably don't understand them that well. And this has benefited me in a few ways. So first of all, I've trained myself to be skeptical of news and opinion that affirms what I already believe. I'm trying to have reverse confirmation bias. And then second, it's helped me remember that people believe things for a reason, and usually it's not because they're crazy. And if I just spend my whole life wanting to write people off as crazy, that frankly says more about me than it does about them. Quick side note, I tried my friend's dad's thing in seminary. I had to give a persuasive speech, so I decided to give a speech on why I thought steroids should be legal in sports, which I don't believe at all. I'm just going to tell you, I had some heads nodding by the end of it. I got an A on the speech, and I never told them I didn't believe it, so they probably thought I was crazy, but whatever. What's my point? Before I even talk about media sources, we have to know ourselves. Are you aware of your biases? Can you argue against your beliefs? Are you willing to think critically? If not, you're going to be easy pickings for fear-mongerers and manipulators. Know yourself. Another aspect of knowing yourself, how much news can you handle? Some of us, we can handle quite a bit without it impacting us. Others of us, if we see one person wrong on the internet, it ruins our whole day. We have to know how much can we handle and what is appropriate. Second, we have to know our why. Why do you want political news? To be more informed? To win an argument? To to increase your loyalty to your side? To try to get involved to help? because maybe you feel guilty because you don't understand what's going on politically. We need to assess our motives as we seek out political news. Some of these motives are more noble than others, and it's worth resisting our less healthy motives. Ultimately, the best education in political matters leads to concrete action in political spaces, Meaning meaning it leads us to actually do something to work toward the common good. Far too many of us engage with political news as a form of entertainment. And that's not always bad, but it can be problematic. There's a term called political hobbyism, and that is the term for the person who spends a lot of time consuming political news and engaging in political conversations, especially online, but they don't actually take any action to to try to kind of make a difference in the world. And it's worth considering, for those of us that engage with political news, how can I allow this information that I'm getting to inform some action to try to seek out the common good? And we have to, and also just, if we're not going to do that, I just want to encourage you, be careful about consuming political news strictly as a hobby. I'm going to tell you what your loved ones are afraid to tell you. It's probably making you angry and less fun to be around. Maybe think about turning off the TV and take up like pickleball or like knitting or bird watching or whatever. So know your why. Why do you care? Why do you want to know? Uh, Number three, root yourself. 
Root yourself. Franciscan, Franciscan priest Richard Rohr says, we don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. Our ability as Christians to process media in a healthy way is driven much more by our emotional and mental health than even by the media we consume. That's why it's crucial that we root ourselves in the love of God and that we're connected to the Holy Spirit so that we begin our search for political news as people formed by the Spirit of God, not by the world. When we are rooted in the love of God, we're less likely to have our anxiety and fear or tendency towards tribalism provoked by what we read or hear. And unfortunately, many media consumers look to politics as the source of their grounding, which is, of course, a recipe for anger and insecurity. Next, know the media. Media is a business. Like any other business, media companies must make money to pay their bills and continue operating. That means they need to produce content that attracts attention. And research has proven again and again that we are drawn to news stories that are sensationalistic and negative. That means when we engage with media, two of the largest biases we're gonna come across have nothing to do with conservative or liberal ideology. There's gonna be a bias towards sensationalism and a bias toward negativity. This doesn't mean the media is bad, but it's important to be aware that when we engage with media, we're likely to find sensationalism and negativity. And that will lead us to believe that things in the world are worse than they actually are. I mean, I, think about this. Like, things on planet Earth are objectively better than they have ever been in the history of humanity. And they're getting better. Why do we not feel that way? There are a few different reasons. But one of them is that stories of human progress don't get clicks. And the other side is coming for you does. So we get more of that. So if you find your news consumption constantly angers you, maybe consider stopping. Um, and maybe just recognize that on some level, when we're really engaging in content that's like hyperbolic and angry and, and fear-based, fear um, we're being played, right? We're being played. We're being provoked to anger purposefully because it's good for business. So those are some personal things. Just be aware of what's going on inside of you and just understand what the media is. Now let's get to the practical. Uh, number one, investigate your sources. The more we know about our media sources, the more effectively we can interpret what we learn from them. All media sources, all personalities have biases. We've certainly emphasized that point. When evaluating news media companies, it's helpful to know where they land ideologically and where they land in terms of the depth of their reporting. Any attempt to accurately assess the ideological perspective of major news sources is going to be imperfect because even that assessment is coming from human beings and all of us are what? Biased, right? But there are several organizations that have, come work, that have done good work to help in this area. Adfontismedia.com is a good one. Allsides.com is another good one. And ground.news is also helpful. So there are these different organizations that will, again, help you assess Hey, what am I, like, where does this publication or where does this media figure land on the partisan spectrum? When it comes to individuals in media, it's helpful to learn about their backgrounds to understand their perspectives better. Uh, so, for example, Paul Krugman and David Brooks both, wrote, both write for the New York Times. Paul Krugman is very liberal. David Brooks is moderately conservative. That doesn't mean any one thing they say is true or false, but it's helpful just to know as you engage with their content, where are they coming from? We ought to be especially wary of media sources and personalities that are so partisan that they rarely or ever can critique the ideas of one side or commend the ideas of the other. And we also, of course, need to be careful about consuming content from a person or a media company we know nothing about. If you got it in an email forward, it's probably not worth your time. Consider sources that are cited within a story. Trustworthy journalists cite sources. So we should check where media sources get their information. Uh, additionally, do not give even a little bit of your brain space to a media source that does not print retractions. People that tell the truth admit when they get it wrong. People that don't double down and obfuscate and all of that, right? Uh, next, 
Use proper constraints. Use proper constraints. I think as we engage with media, we need to do so within a few different constraints. Number one, ideological constraints, which I touched on this a moment ago. And many media companies and personalities are so ideologically slanted, meaning super liberal or super conservative, that they, in my opinion, should not be trusted. Uh, that's why I hear people say things like, well, I like to listen to both sides. And like, okay, like that's, a good, that's good in theory, but, but here's the thing. You can eat McDonald's and Taco Bell, and you've covered both sides of something, but you're still not healthy. <laughs> right? You get what I'm saying? Like, oh, hey, I read far left and far right. Well, great. Now you're jacked in two different ways. <laughs> right? We're much better served... And by the way, see, if I criticize McDonald's, it doesn't mean I like Taco Bell. Like, it's just, it's, anyway, I'm going to get off my little soapbox here. We're better served if we avoid this sort of media and get our information from news sources less beholden to partisan ideology. And I want to be clear on this. This isn't because a partisan view is always bad or that being right in the middle is uniquely good. Certainly, my own views are far from the middle on any number of topics. However, if we're talking media sources, generally speaking, a media source that is less partisan is more about reporting information. Whereas the more partisan a media source gets, it's less about reporting objectively and more about arguing for a perspective. As a general rule, Cable news and talk radio should be avoided as those mediums are dominated by highly partisan content. If you can't lay off the cable news, at least stick to their hard news programming. Uh, only watch those segments. Steer clear of opinion. Opinion is where you're going to get into all sorts of... This is Hannity on the right, Maddow on the left, that type of thing. That's where you're getting into some unhelpful territory. So ideological constraints. Second, time constraints. Uh, there is an endless stream of news and opinion content available to us. We could spend every waking moment reading every single story and barely scratch the surface, and boy, would we be fun to be around. Um, there is great value in being informed about the major issues of the day, but there is greater value in things like human relationships, gainful employment, a spiritual life, right? Too much media consumption is linked to many negative physical, mental, emotional, and relational health outcomes. We must not allow news media consumption to, in place, to replace much more important areas of life. It's got to stay within its constraints. Next, input constraints. And this is similar to time constraints. We must carefully watch what percentage of the total content that we receive in the course of a given day is political news. We can't allow media consumption to keep us from reading scripture, reading theology, reading, say, for professional or personal development, or simply just reading fiction. The news media is part of a healthy input diet. It is not the whole thing. If you have to choose between being ignorant about current events or ignorant to the heart of God, like, let's make sure we're making the right choice there, right? we got to keep it within input, input constraints. So those are some constraints. Next, another practical tip is be suspicious of sensationalism. If you scroll through the websites of the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Huffington Post, and One American News Network, you're going to notice differences between the first two and the latter two. One of those differences is the use of sensationalistic language. Media sources that value informing the public don't tend to use highly emotive language unless it is truly warranted. In contrast, more partisan sources tend to emphasize stirring people emotionally. If a media source uses a lot of emotionally provocative language, that's a sign you may want to consider looking elsewhere for your news, right? I was... I was at the library uh, a couple of weeks ago picking up a book for this series, and I'm just a book nerd, so I just can't help myself. I have to go see what the new books are every time I go to the library. Some of you are nodding your heads. Thank you for making me feel less weird. And <laughs> there's a conservative radio host who is just 
known for being just kind of flagrantly dishonest. He would be like way at the extreme end of any of the charts I just referenced for you. And he has a new book called The Democrat Party Hates America. (laughs) I'm not a Democrat. I want to make that very clear. (laughs) That is juvenile, dishonest nonsense. And I would say the exact, I mean, anybody who writes a book that says the Republican Party hates America, I'd say the exact same thing, right? Give your attention to people who make thoughtful arguments, not those who scream hysterics. And understand this, research has shown that pundits and analysts often overstate their own views to sound more extreme than they actually are because that attracts eyeballs and clicks. In other words, those who are being sensationalistic, they don't even believe themselves. It's a show, it's fake, and it's harmful. Next, value thoughtfulness over agreement. When I'm evaluating a media source or personality, I value thoughtfulness. Is this someone who is really thinking through their views more than I value, do I agree with them or not? I wanna listen to people who if they say something I disagree with, that makes me want to reconsider my own perspective. Value thoughtfulness over agreement. Next, value, if possible, long form over short form. In other words, go for depth, not breadth. I'm a huge fan of selective ignorance as I think that's actually a key element of developing deep understanding. So I'll tell you what I mean by that. Often as I skim headlines, I'll see a headline, and I'll think to myself, I'm going to remain ignorant about that issue. And that's okay. There's a lot of things in the world, I don't really understand them, I don't really know what's going on, I know they're in the news. I would rather have deep understanding of a few things than understand many issues superficially. So rather than jumping from story to story, Maybe find a long-form article or a long-form podcast on one topic, or even maybe even read a book about a subject instead. Uh, Next, read locally. Local issues are ones we can take action on, and and Pastor Lance will say more about that in a minute. Um, Next, pay for your news. High-quality news costs money to produce, and it costs money to access. By subscribing to our local newspaper or to a news aggregation service like Apple News Plus, you're not only supporting the work that news media does, but you're getting yourself access to higher quality news. Now, a caveat to that, Newsmax, which is super far right, and Mother Jones, which is super far left, both have channels on Apple News Plus. So paying for your news still requires some discernment. And then my last tip on this topic is let your media consumption inspire prayer. Let it be an invitation to prayer. As we read, we have to remember The news media is incentivized to stir us up, to make us angry, to make us afraid, because it keeps us coming back. If we feel those emotions, we are much better served going to the Lord in prayer than letting our fear and our anger fester. Similarly, when we read good news, we can let that be an opportunity to praise God. So many more things could be said on the topic, but those are some basic principles. I'm happy to talk to you about my own personal news diet and how I navigate that if you're, if you're interested. So next, I want to move on to a few things about how to have better political conversations. How to have better political conversations. <laughs> Number one, remember that you are a Christian. <laughs> you have been called out of darkness and into light. The most important task you have been given is not to help your party win elections. It is to represent and glorify your king. Jesus told us to let our lights shine into the darkness so people may see our good deeds and glorify our father in heaven. That means we are honest. That means we try to live peacefully with others. It means we care much more about the log in our own eye than the speck in someone else's. It means we are quick to listen and slow to speak. It means we are grounded in something far deeper than politics. Um, It means our example is Jesus. I've said this in sermons before, but politically active people... I just don't understand this, will so often justify their bad behavior by saying the other side does it too. You don't respect them at all. And they're your standard for behavior now? (laughs) Well, they're doing it too. No. Our standard is Jesus. Our standard is Jesus. Uh, Number two, build trust first. See, one of the problems with locating politics 
so close to the center of our lives as, as we often do, is we end up talking about it in environments where it isn't appropriate. Some of us talk about politics online, where now we're sharing political opinions with people, in some cases, we don't even know them, right? And we're getting theirs, right? Others bring politics into conversations with people that they hardly know or that they see infrequently. Sometimes subconsciously, we'll just make offhand kind of borderline inflammatory political remarks just because, again, politics is so close to the center of our lives. And political conversations where there isn't mutual trust often go badly. Y you see this if you, if you read the news at all, but seemingly every year around like Thanksgiving time, different media outlets will write these think pieces like how to handle political conversations at Thanksgiving. I want to write an article that says, why on earth are you talking about politics at Thanksgiving, comma, you moron? I'm gonna, I just violated one of the principles I'm going to give you in a second. But there's a lot that I'll do for a laugh. But, but, but seriously, that's absurd. You're gathering around a table with people you see twice a year, and you're talking about politics? That is incandescently stupid. I'm sorry to tell you. Like, what are we even doing here? I'll, I'll tell you how I really feel in a minute. No. But there's, n there's not a lot of trust built. So we need to discipline ourselves. We need to discipline ourselves to generally only have political conversations with people we trust and who trust us. Where the relationship is sturdy enough to handle disagreement and where there's an increased willingness to listen. So build trust first. Next, look to build common ground. Uh, what do you agree on? What goals do you share? It's probably not true that your political opponents hate America. We both want America to thrive. We have very different visions for it. How do we get there? Is there a way to frame the conversation so it's a conversation about how, how to best reach a shared desired outcome? If you can do this, then you'll be able to establish some sort of goodwill. It's also, I think, in a lot of our kind of more debate-oriented conversations, it's worth asking the question, am I willing to change my mind on this issue? And I think I've, had, I've been in conversations with people, well, I'll ask them, are you willing to change your mind on this issue? Because first of all, changing your mind is really, really, really difficult. So, so that is a whole other topic of maybe our goal in political conversation should be something a little more kind of a smaller goal than fully changing someone's mind. But I think it's worth asking that question because if I know I'm unwilling to change my mind about a subject and there are a few that I'm pretty darn close, let's talk about something else. Like, we're just kind of wasting each other's time here, right? But let's look for common ground. And then let's just, before we even enter into dialogue, is this something where I'm willing to change my mind? And if it's not, that's okay. Let's talk about something else. Uh, next, this is the, the rule I just violated. Whenever possible, define others in terms they accept. So like moron, like not a good one. When talking about people who believe differently than you, whenever possible, commit to defining them in terms that they would accept. They would say, yes, those are my actual beliefs. Yes, that is what I actually think. Yes, that is my perspective on that issue. Because what we need to be able to do is try to understand people as they actually are, not as we've invented them to be in our heads. If you live your life believing that all Democrats are communists and all Republicans are fascists, like that's not going to go well for you and it's dishonest, and it's going to harm and alienate people. If we want to have healthier debates and dialogues, do the work to listen and understand. Listen to me. No one is insulted into changing their mind. You're right. I am an idiot. I want to change my worldview now. Like, nobody does that. And nobody will listen to the logic of your arguments if they don't trust the intention of your heart, right? So if you want to critique someone's beliefs, make sure you understand them first. And when we're malicious and we're mean-spirited and we describe others in terms that they don't accept, it causes people to change their minds, not about the issue, but usually about us, right? Next, ask good questions and listen. One thing I'm really trying to get better at is if I'm in a disagreement with somebody and my instinct is to correct them, to try to just ask a question instead. And like an honest question too. How did you come to believe that? That's interesting. Like, tell me more about like, how that belief works itself out, right? That kind of goes back to my previous point. Listen to understand, define people in terms that they would accept. 
This helps you understand people, and it also, you gain credibility because you show, hey, I'm willing to engage with you and actually try to hear what you have to say, right? Uh, in his book, Talking Across the Divide, Justin Lee writes, when you begin the conversation by listening instead of talking, you accomplish more than just gathering information. Right from the start, you're setting a tone of cooperation rather than antagonism. You're sending a message to the other person that they aren't going to have to fight in order to be heard by you. Last couple on this topic, um, keep it in person. My rule for discussing political concerns is the same as my rule for discussing pretty much anything contentious ever. Do it in person or at least voice to voice. No email, no texting, certainly for the love, no social media comments sections, right? When we communicate in writing, it's very difficult to infer tone, and consequently, it's very easy to misunderstand someone or be misunderstood, right? So keep your conversations in person. Um, and on a related note, just don't talk politics with strangers. Your cardiologist will thank you. <laughs> and then this might seem like a weird tip, Talk about other things. I firmly believe that one of the best ways to have better political conversations is to have less of them. And there are a lot of political conversations that don't need to happen. They accomplish literally nothing and leave people stressed out and angry. When my brothers, their spouses, my family of four, and my parents get together for dinner, there are multiple, very distinct, worldviews present at the table. And we get along fine. You want to know why? Because we talk about other things. And, and I want to be clear, it's not some like avoidant thing where we're all sitting there like, oh my gosh, if someone says the word immigration, there's going to be a fist fight. There is none of that. There is zero tension, zero risk of that. We don't feel this need to bring up topics we disagree about. Instead, we just enjoy one another's company. It's really not that hard. And you might be saying, well, I'm good with that, but my crazy uncle isn't. And I would say, first of all, are you defining him in terms he would accept? And <laughs> second, he might deserve it, I, I understand. Second, don't be afraid to say, um, crazy uncle, I love spending time with you, but would you please not bring up politics when we're together? And it's okay to create a boundary. I've done it myself. There are people I've said, do not talk to me about politics, please. Anything else you want to talk about, I'm game, but not that. Uh, Winston Churchill has this great quote. He says, a fanatic is one who can't change his mind and won't change the subject. Uh, don't be a fanatic and feel free to set boundaries with fanatics in your life. My last two in this category that I'm just going to give you and skip to my final one because I'm running low on time. Uh, value relationships over issues. If I convince a person who I love that they're wrong on an issue, but I've damaged our relationship, that's a loss. That's a loss, right? Value relationships over issues. And then learn the phrase, I don't know. We are not experts on most any political issue there is, even the ones we've studied a lot. And it's okay to not have an opinion on everything. And what we have to understand is so many of the contentious, hot-button issues in society are brought up for the purpose of making us angry and afraid and upset. There's a reason why, you'll notice, some issue will be like, big, like a big, hot thing in the political world for like three months, and then all of a sudden, we don't talk about it anymore. Like, it's almost like the issue wasn't the issue. It's almost like just outrage and tribalism were the issue. Hmm. We don't need to get suckered into that. We don't need to get suckered into that. It's okay to not have an opinion, and we certainly don't need to get sucked in to having a, like, having a immediate like black and white opinion on very complex topics. Couple things on biblical principles for better political decisions. The Bible does not have all that much to say about public policy. Uh, similarly, more often than not, the Bible is not an answer book. I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that uh, God has given us brains, and he does not seem all that interested in doing our thinking for us. Uh, there are very few situations where you can just quote a verse and be done. Rather, it seems that God's way is to show us principles and to ask us to use wisdom to apply those principles. So I'm just going to name a few biblical principles that all of us, regardless of where we're at ideologically, can use to make political decisions and influence our political behavior. Number one, a vision for human dignity. 
We understand that human beings are not just biological accidents. We're image bearers of God. And we know that because of that, every person is worthy of inherent dignity and honor. If you remove God from the equation, it is frighteningly easy to discard human dignity, but God teaches us the preciousness of every human being. Second, there's a vi- we have a vision for human flourishing. Someone once asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus told a story where someone from, an ha- from a hated ethnic group was the hero. Christianity teaches a vision for radical inclusion and a radical concern for those outside of our affinity groups. So many go into politics today intent on sucking up as much power as they can and destroying the other side. And too many Americans vote based only on what benefits them and people that look like them. But Christians are equipped with an expansive view of who our neighbor is, and consequently, we can have a heart for broad human flourishing, not narrow self-interest. Whether we want to talk about the calling of Abram in Genesis chapter 12, God's instructions to captive Israel in Jeremiah 29, Jesus' call to be witnesses in Acts chapter 1, Peter's admonition to watch how we live before our unbelieving neighbors, and so many other examples. What we find in scripture is a repeated call to be people who are motivated by love to seek the flourishing of all people. Next, we have a belief in transformation. A belief in transformation. A fundamental difference in the way that Christians approach any sort of conflict relative to others is that our goal is not to defeat our opponent. Our goal is to see them transformed, right? Our goal is to see our enemies transformed. That doesn't mean we don't seek to limit the influence of those we believe to be harmful, but it means we want to see those people transformed. That's why it ought not be difficult for us as Christians to pray for our leaders regardless of what we think of them. That even if you think a leader on any level of government is uniquely harmful for society, can you not pray for their salvation? Can you not pray for their sanctification? Can you not pray for their redemption? Can you not pray for the healing of whatever's going on in their heart that has created the brokenness that you observe? There are any number of things we can pray for when it comes to praying for our leaders. Next, creation care. We know that while the world is not our home, the Bible affirms the earth is not an accident. It was intentionally created by our loving God. The psalmist tells us the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and the heavens declare the glory of God. We don't discard creation as some might lead us to do. Neither do we worship creation as others might lead us to do. Rather, we respect creation as a precious gift from God. Next, we have eternal perspective. Eternal perspective. The theological term for this is eschatological hope. We are people with a hope that goes beyond this world. Politics and those in the politics industry would have us believe that politics are the most important things there are. They speak in apocalyptic terms that only seem to escalate. We're on like the ninth most important election of my lifetime. We know better. We know better. We can engage in politics. We can even be frustrated by political matters, but we're not owned by our politics and we're not devastated by them. We do not look to politics to meet our spiritual needs or be, the ult- be our source of ultimate hope. Next, love for enemies. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount teaches us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Paul says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. These approaches are not very popular with the Republican or Democratic National Committee. I don't know if you've noticed. Speaking on Independence Day in 1965, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. famously said to those who opposed civil rights, we will so appeal to your heart and your conscience that we will win you in the process. Therefore, our victory will be a double victory. We're compelled to be people driven by, defined by, compelled by love even for our enemies. Next, a preference for the poor. From the beginning to the end in scripture, God makes his heart for the poor very, very clear. One of the bases by which God judges nations is how they treat the poor. 
In Ezekiel, God chastises Sodom for being arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. In Matthew 25, Jesus questions nations on their treatment of the poor. Lance is going to get into some of this in a minute, but listen, the Bible does not give us specific prescriptions on how to help the poor and how involved the government should be in that process. Reasonable, good faith Christians can disagree on that topic. What we cannot disagree on is the importance of the poor and that they are close to God's heart. Similarly, there is no verse I can quote in the Bible to decide the question of how many immigrants the United States should let in and what we should do with those who enter illegally. I cannot quote you chapter and verse on that. But, and and, and I should say there is room for Christians to disagree on the answers to those questions. They're big questions. But there's not room for us to disagree on the reality that Every immigrant is of everlasting value and every immigrant is an image bearer of God, right? We have to understand those things. Last two and then I'm done. Suspicion of human nature, but a vision for human character. Christian anthropology teaches that we have a sin nature. Because we know the limits of human nature, we can be people who understand the needs, the need for checks and balances and accountability. But we also understand the importance of character. Scripture repeatedly exhorts us to live into our identity in Christ, to not be conformed to this world, and to live as ambassadors for him. And then last one, we have belief in the power of God. We have belief in the power of God. We know there is a power that is beyond us, that is present and at work. We have the tools of fasting and prayer at our disposal. We have biblical examples of people like Esther and Nehemiah whose commitment to prayer changed the course of nations. Before we can even talk about issues, let's talk about principles that we can bring to bear wherever we are on the spectrum. But that raises the question, how do we start to apply these principles to different issues? What about issues that the Bible doesn't speak to? To pick up the discussion at that point, and to bring us the rest of the way, would you welcome to the stage, Pastor Lance Hahn. Hello, everyone. Unlike Pastor Brian, I get my news from a man in a bunker, and I believe in unicorns. Amen? (laughs) Praise God. There are differences between him and I. Those are two of them. Now, y'all, of course, we want everyone to consult Scripture on any important question. Why? Because it's the clearest revelation of God to man, and it's authoritative for all Christians. Is that true? Yes, absolutely. But too often, we're presented with a political subject that isn't directly referred to in Scripture, or when it's referred to, it's unclear or has seemingly contradictory perspectives. So what do we do there? Here's the principle. Where Scripture is silent, godly wisdom prevails. Where Scripture is silent, godly wisdom prevails. I'm going to define terms so that we're all on the same page. Knowledge is knowing the facts and information to know a given subject. In other words, it's getting accurate information. Wisdom is defined as the ability to discern good sense. That is knowing how to put the facts together in a useful way for a proper outcome. If knowledge is the dots... Wisdom is how to connect the dots in a meaningful way. Godly wisdom is the ability to discern the heart and will of God on a subject for a course of action. If knowledge is the dots and wisdom is connecting the dots, then godly wisdom is connecting the dots in a way that God sees them. God's word says in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. 
Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path, for wisdom will come into your heart. I'd like to present you with four principles for discerning and managing the wisdom of God on a practical subject. However, there is a warning to this. And that is simply that I'm going to use examples, real life examples of political issues. They are going to include trigger language. I need you to put on your most mature hat and I need you to realize and look through the lens of analytical thought so that we can look at it as a puzzle. I'm going to teach you how to think, not what to think. You are not going to be fed a viewpoint. Are we all tracking with that? But I'm going to use real life examples in order to do that, all right? There's no secret agenda here, it's just a training session. So here are the four principles. Number one, examine all the sides. You've heard this a little bit in Pastor Brian's talk. People think what they think for a reason. Examine all sides. What are the other perspectives rather than just your own? And assess them on their own merits. Now, you may not think it's a legitimate perspective, but it's a perspective nonetheless, and you still need to do your homework. It is unlikely that you understand another perspective, as Pastor Brian said, until you can actually argue it for them because it's only when you have all the perspectives on the table that you can sift and sort the proper one. God tells us in Proverbs 18, 17, the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him, right? Multiple sides. You may think what you think because it's all that you've heard. What if there was another side? When California called for no singing in church. Anybody remember that? Was that a, it was in, during the pandemic and they said that singing in groups was not to happen. Now, they were looking through one lens, how to stop the transmission of a contagious disease. They saw singing as a means of transmission. It seemed practical to them to avoid super spreader situations. Unfortunately, they didn't take into consideration that for a Christian, verbal proclamation of God's goodness and praise is actually mandatory for us. And so we simply couldn't do that. When they looked through a lens of essential business and essential activities, praise was not given appropriate consideration. You tracking with me? In other words, there was another side that they missed. We don't want to do that. We need to consider the other side. If there are too many perspectives on an issue, if there are too many sides to study, we must humbly use the phrase, I haven't researched this well enough to have a solid opinion. I haven't researched this well enough to have a solid opinion. That's actually an excellent phrase. You should keep it in your back pocket especially if someone starts getting nasty. Because the minute you say that, they go, oh, good, you're admitting you're stupid. And you said, yes, I am. And you walk away. <laughs> Usually, a very complex subject boils down to a few philosophical principles that someone is operating off of. They are running a narrative in their head. When you talk to them, they have one example in mind. They're thinking that as the whole. So whatever you say, they're gonna fit into their storyline, and if it doesn't match, they're going to disagree with you, all right? So I wanna talk about something not very controversial called abortion. Abortion seems on the surface to be a very simple subject. Either you're for it or you're against it. But it becomes far more complex when you start digging into it. Debates on this subject have raged for a very long time. There are numerous aspects to it. So I'm going to teach you what it looks like to expect complexity. So for example, we begin with questions. What constitutes a baby? Is it the moment of conception? Is it body formation? 
Is it heart formation once blood begins to pump through the heart and you have an actual heartbeat? Is that what it is? Another way to look at it, are we against, if you're against abortion, are you against it because of God's prerogative or because of hurting babies? Those are actually two forks in the road that go very different directions. Philosophically, emotionally, the visceral reaction to abortion tends to be split in those two directions. So for example, is it God's authority over all life? That he's the only one that gets to determine who lives and dies, and we are not allowed to make that decision. It is not just that he is the creator. It is also that he has put his imago Dei, his image, in human beings, and that means all human beings are his stuff. Is that your concern? Or is it on the other side, many people hate abortion due to the fact that it kills babies, that it's the harm to an innocent individual that is the main thing for them. Here's another one. One of the reasons why it's gotten so complicated and it's argued in large broad strokes is are we protecting women or are we protecting babies? That common debate says those two things clash, right? That you either have to love one person or another person. The bottom line of all that type of examination digs down into the why we believe what we believe. When you know that, it helps clarify other issues. The more we can find out what's important to us, what's important to the Lord, we can then establish a framework for making decisions on issues more clearly. Y'all tracking with me? All right, number two, examine ramifications of your view. Sometimes a perspective seems right until it's played out in real life. Sometimes a perspective seems right until it conflicts with another perspective and belief. That's why you have to play through all the ramifications of what you say you believe. It is consistency and integrity of thought. So let's go back to the ramifications of views on baby life and abortion. Since many of the issues surrounding it have to do with God and life issues, whatever we determine in that examination will have significant ramifications for other issues. For example, if abortion is bad due to God's right to choose life, then it must significantly reflect in your opinions on birth control, death penalty, euthanasia, gun use, military, police, and others. You tracking with me? You don't get to have contradictory views, all right? Here's the other one. If abortion is bad due to hurting babies, then there must be a focus to make sure the baby's cared for after exiting the womb, just as much as it's protected in the womb. Also, there's a question about what can occur before the baby knows or feels anything. You notice how this all bends your thought on why you think the way you think. This is what we must track on. If life begins at a heartbeat, then what happens when we can keep a heartbeat going in an adult, but the brain waves are gone, right? Is it hard or not, all right? If life is found in the blood, and we talk about blood coursing through, then what happens when we get a blood transfusion? Now all of a sudden you're switching life. Do you all track it on me? Everything has a ramification. The point is we don't get to believe contradictory things, right? We have to think through. The concept of integrity means sound or consistent throughout. Our viewpoints must be whole or at least as close as we can get. We need to weigh the ultimate impact of our decisions. There are decisions that seem good now, but they can end up being faulty and useless. That means we need to think through our opinions to see if they actually do what we think they can do. So for example, we vote in a really nice politician who's ineffectual. That doesn't help anybody, right? You go, but they're really nice. All right, cool, didn't help. Here's another example. We vote for a bill that doesn't have any financial support, and so it doesn't work. That didn't help, all right? Now there's a caveat to this. Let's say you decided to vote for a third party in a presidential race. You didn't vote for a Democrat candidate. You didn't vote for a Republican candidate. You voted for a third party. And we talked about it last week. That person's not going to win yet, right? The system's not set up yet for them to be able to win. All right. So they don't win. 
Is that a win or a loss? Because it depends on what you were trying to do. If you were trying to vote for that person to show support for that person, it's still a win because you showed them support. If you're trying to draw attention to a subject, you still drew attention to the subject. If you're trying to make a commentary on I don't like my two options, you still made a comment. That's not a loss. But if you were saying I simply want to bet on a losing horse and I hope they'll win, that's a mistake, right? You just think through what are the ramifications. We need to think through the reality of actual change, either in the short term or long term. If there is no possibility of it making change, we're probably wasting our time. For example, if we vote for an instant outcome when there's no vehicle to make that come to fruition, we made a mistake. I'll give you an example, school shootings. Let's say, for example, you're here about school shootings and you said, you know, the solution should be that we have an armed guard in every classroom. Now, your intention is to protect the children in the classroom. Here's the problem. We don't have enough funding for education right now. Where exactly are you going to find that funding? Because the practicality of trying to have one in every classroom is not appropriate. So what we end up doing is we go, no, 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 my heart is good. I have something that I'm trying to do, but we actually need to think about how it would play out as we're making determinations. Most intentional societal change happens through well laid out and executed strategy. The civil rights movement was designed in a lot of behind the scenes meetings and plannings. Martin Luther King Jr. didn't march from Clovis to Fresno for a reason, right? He marched to Selma and Montgomery. Why? Because it had meaning to it. That's a strategy. It's not just willy-nilly. It's intentional, right? That's how it's done. So consider the outcome, but also consider your process. The ends do not justify the means. A lot of times we'll say, well, I didn't like how it happened, but at least we got there. If the means are unethical, the result is marred. Are we all tracking on that? Principle number three, account for nuance. Account for nuance. Sometimes a perspective can be right in one way, but not in another. Sometimes something can be right depending on the degree. As long as it's consistent, a, view, a viewpoint can have varying nuances to it. To say that someone is pro-life can mean many different things to many different people. To say that someone supports equal rights can mean they include all groups, all types, or only certain qualifications of groups and types. Someone can believe in equal rights for all people, but not all in the same ways. All of that is nuance. It accounts for complexity. It understands that there are many layers and not all layers are speaking about the exact same thing so there can be variations. For example, it is possible to be passionate about the protection of babies and traditionally pro-life, which is traditionally a Republican platform view, but at the same time, you may have a heart towards equality rights for minorities, which is traditionally a Democrat platform view that is still consistent. Are we all tracking? Just because it falls in two camps doesn't mean it's not consistent. It is still consistent because both views are trying to protect vulnerable people. They are both the heart of God. They just happen to be on different platforms. Tracking with me? It is very possible to believe in personal responsibility and in helping the poor. It is very possible to love LGBTQ people intensely and not vote for gay marriage. It is very possible to believe in universal health care but not be in favor of socialism. It's not wrong to love our homeless population yet be frustrated with how it's being handled. Y'all tracking with me? These are called nuance. All of these dual perspectives are rejected in the media and on the polarizing conversations. Refuse to let them dictate your narrative. We are allowed to see a different through line than they do. 
We are called to follow the heart of God regardless of what camp it winds through. Wisdom demands that we do what is right despite predetermined societal roles provided. If we are consistent with God, then we are consistent. Amen? Number four, as Pastor Brian said, and we're going to beat this drum as much as we can, adjust for personal bias. Adjust for personal bias when you're making your decisions. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? He very, very clearly articulated that an unexamined mind and heart is dangerous and cannot be trusted. Human beings vote much more and make decisions much more based on emotion than on logic. We are instinctively self-protective. Therefore, we need to examine our bias on any issues, especially weighty subjects. For example, it's very tempting to vote for the benefit of our wallet, right? We're all clear on the economic impacts of our lives. Many of us have very specific perspectives on how we think the economic plan should go. Yet to vote for something that is good for the economy when a greater issue is on the table is poor judgment. Most general support in society comes from the wallets of individuals who may or may not directly benefit. Are y'all tracking with me? That is usually paid in forced or mandatory taxes, right? Our taxes pay for a police force that we may or may not use, but society calls for it. Our taxes fix roads, even the ones we don't personally drive on. Our taxes provide clean water for all, so we're familiar with the idea of taking a personal hit for the greater good, yeah? That's just how it works. In a similar way though, there are going to be times when you need to vote for something that is right for society or right for a group of people that is gonna cost you personally. That is the role of a Christian. Some people see it worth whatever the cost is to buy American for a bigger reason. Some people see it worth the cost to support equal rights efforts even though it costs them a job promotion for the greater good. Some people, right, they see though it's worth the cost to support Israel, even when Israel doesn't do things you agree with simply due to its connection to God. Doing the right thing tends to come at a personal cost. Christians should always be willing to pay personally for societal good and blessing to our neighbor. It's what Jesus did. It's what Paul did, right? Another area we tend to have blind spots is in our prejudice towards certain people groups. Our world broadly categorizes and stereotypes. So many of us have been raised and taught to see whole groups of people through a very narrow lens. The three most common groups that receive the greatest bias are the poor, ethnic minority groups, and immigrants. Let's talk about those. The poor. Not everyone who needs government financial assistance is a drug addict or lazy. How do I know that? Because it was my family. My family needed food stamps. Why? Because for no fault of her own, my mom found herself as a single mom with three kids and we couldn't afford to put on the heat. We couldn't afford to do anything. We didn't have enough food. So for a short amount of time as a supplement, even though she was working her tail off, we had food stamps and then ultimately we didn't need them anymore as she was able to move out of it. I watched the same thing happen with my sister. It's not all the way everybody wants to paint it on TV. For minority groups, just because someone is different in an ethnic group from you doesn't mean they don't have the same struggles, same fears, same dreams as you. But at the same time, there are truly unique struggles that shape a unique reality for many members of minority groups. Inequality in the past has led to an extra challenge in the present. To make some adjustments or allowances to assist doesn't mean unfairness, it means fairness. And the reason why I highlight this, and I'm not going to name names, but many minority leaders that you know personally that are extremely influential in this area only got there through assistance. It's the only reason they got to go to school. So what I'm trying to tell you is do not buy 
the general stereotypical line that everybody's like one group. That is not true. Human beings are complex. Let's talk about immigrants. Regardless of your position on immigration, you have to recognize the vast majority of immigrants, even illegal immigrants, are normal people facing extreme challenges. How we deal with the process can be debated, but we must never forget we're talking about people, right? It's not a statistic, it's a person. Okay. So, let's talk about some strategies to bring real change in America, because we're talking about this whole idea and everyone's saying, all right, so what do we do? Well, let's talk about it. There are strategies, there are things we should do. No matter what platform you ascribe to, we all want America to be better, is that right? Yeah, I mean, we don't want it to be worse, we don't want it to be the same, right? I think that America is better in a million ways now than it ever has been, but as a visionary, I'm always gonna look for better. That's just how it works. So, I'm gonna bang the drum of influence, 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 all day long, that's how we change things. We change it through influence, we don't change it through power, we change it through influence, we don't change it through power, I don't know if you've heard this. We change it through influence, we don't change it through power, all right, cool. So what are practical steps? Think local more than national. Bring change in your sphere of influence. You will see more movement for your, from your impact locally. So who are the leaders in your community? How can you leverage your influence right now in small areas to bless immediate society? Voting is not the only expression. There's a trickle up effect. Even if you just affected your school board, that could be enough. But if you are interested, just know this, there's a trickle up effect. What happens locally has national implications, especially in California, why? Because there's a pipeline, there's a chain of influence. The smaller gets chosen for the bigger. So the person on the PTA can go to the city council, the city council can go to the mayor, the mayor can go to the board of supervisors, the board of supervisors can go to state legislature who goes to national representatives. It always goes local, state, national. That's the pipeline. If you wanna affect up there, you have to start back here much earlier. That's a strategy. Here's another one, presence matters. When we get involved, we tend to influence in ways we couldn't with a vote. When we isolate only in Christian and church functions, we remain less influential in society. When we coach a rec soccer team, we meet parents who are involved in a ton of so social realms, right? When we serve on the PTA, we get to know all the systems for influence. We get to establish a relational connection with the decision makers in schools. When we show up in mass to board meetings, it demonstrates that there's more concern than just one lone person trying to champion a cause. This is why marches and protests are held to show a solidarity for a cause. And here's why it matters. They're playing the game. Advisors to politicians read and watch the news. The news covers things that are interesting or can be a larger story. Marches and protests get attention just for visibility reasons. So how do you do the influence game? You show up in mass because then a camera will turn on it. The minute a camera turns on it, now the advisor to the politician is saying, this is an issue we now need to talk about because now it's in the public sphere. That's why it happens. These are not accidental. They're very planned. Here's another premise. Pick a lane. We can't do everything. We can't do everything. We cannot champion every cause. We cannot transform every evil. The biggest stuff is actually God's job. We need to pick a lane and we need to stick close to it. A slug and a shotgun is far more powerful than scattershot, right? We can be informed about many issues, but we cannot do significant advancement in too many. We need to know what things, what assignments God has placed on us to focus. And the needs are vast, but our resources are limited. So what are we gonna focus on? Give you an example here at church. At Bridgeway, we have core ministry. God, his word, salvation, worship, discipleship, right? That's never gonna change. But we have distinctives. We've covered issues, and you've seen that we've had a heart for issues of injustice, issues of 
racial disparity. We've covered issues of women in ministry. We've covered issues of LGBTQ. We've covered issues of supernatural. We've covered issues of regional unity. We've covered issues about trying to talk about politics in a much more balanced way, right? These are distinctives for Bridgeway. Notice all the things I didn't cover. Other great and amazing churches are handling things like what? Anti-sex trafficking, anti-abortion, marriage and family issues, homelessness, poverty. Does that mean that Bridgeway doesn't care about those things? It does not. It means we can't do everything. Our job is to figure out what is our assignment right now. And that is the case for every human being. What burden did God place on your heart? That is now your tag for you to go and make sure that God is inserted into the mix in that issue. You're not supposed to get everybody else on your team because here's what God's doing. He's the great coach. If he gets all the Christians doing all the different things, everything's covered. But our job is to stay in our lane. What's your lane? It might be different than mine, and that's okay. Here's another principle. Support good people. If you are not able to fill a spot of high political influence personally, you need to support a good person who is. So how do we know who's a good person? How do we get those people what they need to do their job? Well, here's the deal. Here's how you select a good candidate. Character matters a lot. The quality of a person will determine whether or not they are trustworthy to do what they say and will do the same thing behind closed doors as in front of the camera. It's tempting to think that character is a bonus, but it's not necessary. That is incorrect. Character matters. Now, here's the truth. I don't need my brain surgeon to be a Christian. I need them really get a brain surgery. But that is a technical skill versus a people skill. Politicians are working with people and people issues. So their heart matters a lot because it's how they're going to think about people is how they're going to act towards people. Does that make sense? Character matters a lot. So why do all politicians and used car salesmen kind of feel slimy? Why is that? Is that a fair? I mean, we all have this kind of weird... Here's why. There's actually a reason. The systems they operate in have a high value for manipulation, lying, and only telling you what you want to hear to pick your pocket. That's why. But why is that? Why do so many politicians end up being yucky? Do they all start slimy? No. No, the vast majority of politicians start with a really good heart and they really want to do something good. So how do they get there? Here's the answer. Always follow the money. Always follow the money. The only way that larger elections can be won is by exposure to the public, and that takes money. Winning is actually about being famous and controlling the narrative. What do Arnold Schwarzenegger, Ronald Reagan, RFK Jr., Jesse the Body Ventura, and Clint Eastwood have in common? They all won their elections. Why? They're famous. That's why. Is it because they're the best person for the job? No, it's because people knew who they were. That's the game. It's the reason why Donald Trump, before you ever heard anything about a presidential run, had his successful book, began to push it through to become a New York Times bestseller, and then started a TV show. Do you remember The Apprentice? That was all planned. You do The Apprentice, that makes you famous, you get in more people's homes, then you're recognizable. That's how he ran his bid. You just need to understand, that's the system. Now here's the problem with that. How do you get out in front of that if you're not famous? You have to buy it. Give me an example. The presidential run for just two candidates in the last election, presidential election, total cost $6.6 billion. That's how much it costs to run. So split it. I don't know if you have billion, billions of dollars. If not, how are you going to run? You can't run against that, right? Okay, both candidates spend individually $200 million on social media alone in the last election. You think social media was just unbiased? No, no, no. It was all over the place. It was paid for. 
only 20% of their funding came from normal people. How do I know that? Because they have to report it all. Okay? Politicians only have three primary ways of paying for their election needs. Number one is self-funding. How in the world did Ross Perot get on the ballot? He's a billionaire. That's why. Number two is grassroots funding. That's a lot of support from a lot of little people collectively. They can do a lot. Does that happen? Yes, it does. And the third way is special interest funding. That's the game changer. Special interests are when a group of wealthy individuals want something done, they offer funding in exchange for their project to be advanced. That is how most national elections are held. You are only funded by a special interest group or many. The problem is the minute they support you, you have to do what they say or they pull your funding. So it's almost impossible to keep winning without playing the game. The pressure to play the political game in backroom deals, compromise, money moves, it's so strong. If you want to stay in the game, you bend. That's why it bends so many good people. Does that make sense? All right, the solution to all of this has to be a large amount of good people supporting good candidates to compete with the wealthy special interest groups. That is going to require a movement, and movements begin with influence. There you go. We're talking strategy. And here's the truth. How do we select good people? Jesus isn't running for office anytime soon. What that means is you're going to have to vote for a human being. A human being is never going to be as good as you want them to be. They're never going to align with you totally. You are choosing what's best as you examine them, right? So you're looking for a couple core issues. One of those is character. One of those is integrity. And then you begin to examine their plan, what do they want to do? Do you see that as an effective plan? That's how we choose candidates. Does that make sense? All right, before we land the plane tonight, I want to speak to you as your pastor. I got two issues on my heart, and we'll finish it out. I want to talk about how to deal with politics at Bridgeway. Okay, y'all are a part of us. You're part of our family. So everything we say and do in this house is under strict accountability because it affects God's glory and his people. All leaders here are constantly under scrutiny for what they do and do not say, but that actually extends to all of us at Bridgeway. While we are in God's house or ministering on his behalf through one of our ministries, we must make sure that we are promoting his agenda and only his agenda. I need you to understand, all of our leaders have personal views you've never heard. Why? because we don't share them here. That's not what this is for. This pulpit is not for my agenda. It's for God's agenda only. Does that make sense? When you're in God's house, this is not your personal pulpit. You do not use your influence at this church to try to create a toxic environment or push your way. That is not what we do here. This is to be a safe space for a very diverse crowd. That's what we're doing. We're talking about a variety of people hearing the gospel. I don't want anything to ruin that, all right? There are diverse perspectives, there are varying experiences, there are different histories here, and everybody's on a different road in their salvation experience. We have people here that do not yet know the Lord. There are people here that know the Lord really, really well. When you're in such a diverse group, you must be more cautious on how you communicate, right? Because not everybody can handle what you and your buddies can handle. They can't understand what you're saying right? So don't assume everyone agrees with you. They do not. We are very diverse. So if you start saying things and you assume people are with you, they are not with you. Usually if they think that you outnumber them, they'll just stay quiet and you'll never know. You need to be sensitive to that. As the Bay Area moves here, even your region is becoming more purple, right? It's becoming blue and red, blue and red, blue and red. It's changing around you. So this whole expectation that, oh, my neighbors think like I think, that is no longer the case. Be very sensitive to that. Watch our comments. You're allowed to hold a personal view. You're allowed to passionately hold a personal view. I just need you to be appropriate in the way you communicate it when you're on God's territory. Does that make sense? We do not disparage political leaders here. 
okay? This whole thing, like we're gonna attack and yell at the other president or do whatever or say mean, we don't do that here. That's unacceptable in our culture. And you're like, well, they can't hear me. I can hear you. So I'm not okay with that. Does that make sense? Because are we or are we not Jesus' kids? If we are God's kids, we don't ever do that because it says more about you than it says about them. Trust me, their actions are already telling plenty. The minute you go after them, now I got a problem with you. Does that make sense? We have to be very gentle on that. And we always wanna look, as Pastor Brian said, for powerful common ground. Before we are Americans, before we are an ethnic group, before we are part of any party, we are Christians, we are children of God. That means that we're looking at brothers and sisters the most important part of who we are is in common. At the foot of the cross, we have everything in common. We are in need of a savior and he saved us. Why would we argue about that? And so the last thing I wanna share with you as your pastor as we close out this whole series is I wanna give you three things on why you should have a ton of hope. Number one, God never stepped off the throne. God is always in charge and is always 10 steps ahead of every possible scenario. Number two, God puts all leaders in place. How do I know that? Romans 13, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed and those who resist will incur judgment. Sometimes God puts leaders in place that will advance his agenda and sometimes he gives us the leaders we deserve. At the end of the day, he's still calling the shots. And number three, don't let radicals get you off your game. Don't let radicals get you off your game. Work very hard to control your internal narrative. You can't control the external narrative. Control your internal narrative. It's always towards Jesus. Do not let the things of this world ruin your peace or ruin your joy. Do not listen to polarizing voices trying to scare you, trying to teach you to hate. Don't let their agenda deviate you from the assignments that the Lord gave you. My friends, we have so much to be thankful for. We have so much comfort, so much peace, so much joy in the Lord. We have so much power and so much authority in the name of Jesus. May we live confidently humble with our eyes fixed on Christ and influence wherever we can influence for the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. All right, everyone. We are ready for some Q&A. Uh, we've got some questions, and uh, keep them coming, uh, just in case we get through some of these fast. So don't feel like uh, if... You know, if you have a last minute question, just go ahead and send it in. Uh, we may get to it, we may not, but um, we're going to try our best. So we're going to start off um, with, you know, we, we talk about having constructive dialogue, um, to being peaceable in the midst of dialogue, uh, avoiding certain spaces that are just unconstructive, and, and one space in particular is online because, uh, Pastor Brian, you shared about how your personal role is having a voice-to-voice -voice or face-to-face -face conversation. Um, is there, is there a time and place to be able to engage other Christians who, you know, I'm sure we've all seen comments where Christians are being very toxic, very cringy, and you feel a compulsion to want to bring some correction. Is there a space for doing that? Uh, sure. I think there, I mean, there's an exception to every rule, right? Or most rules anyway. I, I think generally speaking, Online debates are not very constructive. There's kind of the old joke, no, you don't see in the comments section, wow, that's a great point, I've changed my mind. And, and my whole thing is just to say, okay, I, I wanna use my voice in a place where I really feel some conviction that it can make a difference. If you feel like you're in an online space where you feel like your voice can really make a difference and, and, and be generative and actually help move a debate forward in some healthy ways, uh, go for it. I would, I would exercise some discernment as to, is that really the case? But I don't, don't hear me saying, don't ever engage online ever. I just find as a general rule, real productive conversations tend to happen in person. 
I learned a lesson in, uh, I was at uh, Sacramento State University uh, getting a degree in English. One of my English teachers, he was very anti-Christian, uh, vocally. And uh, we were in a class and he found out that I was a, a young pastor. And so he, he loved to try to poke at me and see what would, what would happen. And I was, very, I was super young, I was very passionate. And um, what I learned through that is if someone else is holding the control of the conversation, you're always gonna come out poorly. Because what I found was, since he was the boss of the room, whatever I would be able to communicate, he would reset the narrative after I completed it. And so the reason I bring this up is because every environment that you're engaging with has a different dynamic to it. For example, if you're in a discussion board concept and everybody is actually throwing out ideas, they've invited that. That's actually the point of it. If you're in something where everyone's talking about their dogs and then everyone's talking about their vacation and then boom, you blast it with, you know, you know, this presidential candidate's the Antichrist. Uh, that's probably not going to be received very well. Just got right? kicked out of the corgi group. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's, <laughs> so I, I encourage read the room and figure out what influence you do have. Now, we all influence. That's part of the idea of tri tribalism. What I would rather us do is be the real us. Don't go in with an agenda, be the real you. And if somebody says something and you have a response to it, you're allowed to respond to it with the real you, the sweet you, the you that Jesus is perfecting. That should be your response. It's not that you're running and hiding from everything. You're allowed to influence, but just be normal about it. You don't just suddenly make it all about one subject. So sometimes, um, you know, so, some, some of us feel that our biblical values seem to be reflected largely, if not entirely, by one particular political platform. Um, if that is the case, then how do we open ourselves up to hearing the other side? Well, if, if we're already predisposed to think that they're wrong. Yeah, I think, I think that the idea uh, that... Now, I, this is bias. This is as a pastor. Uh, the Bible's my thing right? Like that's, that's kind of what I do. It's all my shows uh, online are all about that. And I cannot imagine that the Bible is represented in one party. I simply cannot see that. It's actually inappropriate. So to start with that premise is to say, oh, my views align with this. Okay, well, I'm wondering if our views are aligning with Scripture. I think that's probably a bigger consideration. Now, if you happen to have, let's say we were talking about the issues of how the nation should be run as a business, and you tend to fall into a camp, that's beautiful. There's nothing wrong with that. You have a lot of symbiosis with everybody else. You're like, oh, okay, they see it like I see it. Right on, that's my perspective too. There's nothing, with com nothing wrong with camaraderie. But to say that God wholly aligns with a party through his word would actually be inappropriate. That's actually not true because the platforms are holding polar opposite views and they do not align with scripture wholly in any way. Yeah. Uh, one, one quick thing I'll add to that is on some level, we all think we're right about most, if not all things that we think, because if we were aware of the fact that we were wrong, we would likely think differently. So I, like, it's okay to think that your views are correct. Again, if I thought mine were wrong, I would change them. And, and I want to be open to being shown my views are wrong. Um, please understand me when I, when I say this. Again, speaking pastorally, much like Pastor Lance did, uh, there is no Christian political party. But there are millions and millions and millions of dollars being spent by Republicans and Democrats to convince you that there is. They are not telling you the truth. Uh, there are elements of either side that, of course, are more or less in line with, with biblical principles. And even though I'm not a political party guy myself, I think there is freedom on some level to say, yeah, I lean a little more this way, I lean a little more that way. Great, that's all fine. I'm not gonna try to talk you out of that perspective. But to go, hey, one side is biblical and the other side is not, like, boy, that... that with as much love as I can say, that that is simply not 
correct. Now, there is one caveat to this. If you're not looking at the whole party platform, you're looking at about two issues of a party platform, it's a lot easier to think that. So for example, if you were trying to say, I'm only looking through the lens of a moral issue in this way, you're going to see, because you only grabbed a tiny sliver of it. What we're talking about is if you actually take the whole platform, because you don't get to piecemeal it. If you're saying I'm all with that camp, you actually need to take all their camp stuff. I would imagine you would agree. There are certain issues where like, we would say, yeah, it's pretty clear that the issue of this party is a little more aligned with scripture. Absolutely. And that's what I'm saying. We might be looking at it a little too narrowly. That's all. Uh, so we, um, we had a lot of information thrown at us tonight, and so some of like the details are hard to stick. Uh, Pastor Brian, so you really helped us. Uh, we're providing some uh, news sources for us to consult. Can you sort of remind us some of those, you know, fair-minded sources that we can go to? Yeah, so a few organizations I want to give you. So Adfontes Media, A-D-F-O-N-T-E-S Media, so A-D-F-O-N-T-E-S Media. They have probably the most well-known kind of media bias chart out there. I think it's a pretty good one. Again, take I, their approach to me seems reasonably fair. They have conservatives, liberals, and centrists all kind of get together and try to agree on these things. Um, allsides.com is a good one that'll just kind of, it'll help you understand which media sources are going at a different direct, coming at an issue from different directions. And then uh, ground.news is a, is a pretty good one as well. I I have a love-hate relationship with giving recommendations. On the one hand, I love to just, hey, this is cool, check it out. On the other hand, like, don't take this as Pastor Brian has read every word. He's investigated Adfontes Media's views on every media platform and agrees 100% and so does Jesus. Like, that's not what I'm saying. I think they're just generally helpful, so. Could you sort of summarize or maybe give a, a scenario what it looks like to engage within the church, let's say within Bridgeway, uh, with a fellow brother or sister who is on the other side of a spectrum on an issue? Yeah. I, I think, first of all, the question is, is why are you addressing it? I think, I, I think that we have this idea that somehow has been sold to us that we should say everything we're thinking at all times. And I, and I really don't think that's... <laughs> I don't think that's wise. I, I think that Proverbs would suggest otherwise, that you may go, well, why, why am I even having this conversation right now? Now, if you're loving on them and you're going, wow, we can have a really interesting conversation about this. You're on a trip and you're like, man, you see it this way. I see it that way. What is, I always tell people, this is my rule of thumb. What can your relationship sustain? Right? So if you have a relational uh, strength or foundation, it can handle a lot of go back and forth. If you do not have the relationship, it's going to be misread and it's going to go poorly. So to have another brother or sister in the church and you happen to know, first of all, I'm not quite sure how you know what they believe, but if you do find out what they believe and you go, wow, you tend to show a different perspective. Here's the other thing I need you to remember. Not everybody at Bridgeway is a believer. And this, you gotta be very careful because what happens is, is you'll come in and go, oh, well, you're at church, you must be a Christian. And then you start talking on a certain level and they're like, whoa, I am not there with you. I have no idea what you're talking about. I see it all from this side. So before we talk about any given issue, can we please make sure that we talk about what's more important first? And then if we get to those and it's a more interesting conversation, that's great. The only, and I completely agree with all of that. What can your relationship sustain? I just want to double stamp that is so important. And, and, uh, very related idea is just that of trust. I only want to tr talk politics with people whose maturity I trust, whose ability to have a conversation where we might disagree without freaking out I trust, uh, who I know they're, like to the extent that I'm able to know, like their media diet is relatively healthy if they're telling me where they get their news and I'm like, oh boy, well, let's, boy, what a nice day it is today, isn't it? Let's literally anything else. I, I think those two elements are, are important and, and kind of related to what you said, Lance, motivation I think is huge. Yeah. Like, what, what, am I just trying to, man, I just want to own you and show you that you're wrong. Like, man, yeah. what, what are you doing? Doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So let's piggyback on this topic. And, and Lance, uh, let's talk about sort of a bigger picture view. You know, your heart, you have a heart for regional unity. Yes. So what about different churches? You, you, they all have sort of their own makeup when it comes to the, the political conversation. Yeah. So how, how do churches 
Or how do you envision churches working together, um, partnering with one another when they have a different flavor when it comes to politics? Yeah, so um, just as I don't believe we have total agreement with any other human being, Neither does any churches have total agreement with another church. When you talk about unity, you're not talking about sameness. Um, the idea and what's so beautiful about unity is differences of opinion. Here's what I'm looking for in another church and engaging with them. I'm looking for health. Uh, now, they can have a different perspective because remember, as I was sharing earlier today, we all have a different assignment from the Lord. They may carry a different issue. They may carry it in a different way. That is totally okay because that's what they're interacting with the Lord about. What I'm interested in, are they doing it in a healthy way? Are they doing it in a hurtful way? Are they doing it in an immature way? Those are things that matter more to me than what is their exact stance. In general, if I'm going to work with another church, everything about me is going going to look for common ground. I'm going to look for what we agree on, what we agree on, what we agree on. Now, there's going to be a lot that we don't agree on. Either we're not going to talk about that, or we're going to have to create a trust to where we can talk about that. But unity is difficult because you're dealing with awkwardness, you're dealing with challenges, you're dealing with differences of opinion. That does not mean it's not good. It is worth working for, and I want to continue to work for that. Yeah, that's good. Nothing to add. So there are certain uh, issues that are perennial debates, and we've talked about uh, at least one of them, and that's the issue of abortion. So right. maybe we can use that as an example, um, where we, we might be able to find compromise, uh, common ground on other issues, yeah. maybe, say, government assistance or things like that, uh, maybe immigration, but on an issue like abortion, which is very polarized, yes, um, and we can't find... Uh, a way in ourselves to find compromise. How do we deal with that? Um, do we do we need to find compromise in every issue? Yeah, I don't. I don't think so. I think that um, it's going to come down to uh, again, what's the racial, relational dynamics? Are you needing to mentor and guide that other person? So, for example, if you're a discipler and someone's coming to you and they're saying, "What's your opinion?" You're going to pretty consistently try to guide them in a direction. If you have a peer to peer and they're seeing it one way and you're going, "I don't see that in Scripture at all." I have a lot of friends that feel that way about issues that I'm looking at going, yeah, nope, I do not agree. I don't even know how you see that in the Bible. I mean, I'm looking at it. I'm not seeing the same thing. What that means is for now, that subject is off the table. We are not going to address that subject because they're not willing to learn from me and I'm not willing to learn from them. It's going to get contentious. Yeah. What were your thoughts? I think when it comes to our personal beliefs, like here we are talking about, okay, we want to be open-minded. We want to investigate things from all sides. We want to understand different perspectives. That's all very important. We need to make sure we're clear. That does not mean we have to lack conviction. That's right. Right? What it means is, um, I, I was reading something else this week. This ended up getting cut from my talk tonight. But the idea that, that so many debates and arguments in society uh, that they're just people talking past each other. And I think abortion is a great example of this, by the yes. way. That what you actually want to get to is what this author described as genuine disagreement, where we both actually agree, yes, this is the issue, this is exactly what it is, and we disagree on it. So the issue of abortion, which I personally have a very strong view on, I'm not going to sit here and advocate for, well, you should probably be wishy-washy on that one. And, and in talking about, and, and you might have a different view than mine, which is fine. Like, I'm not, like, whatever, believe what you believe. But what I'm not saying is that open-mindedness means you can't have strong conviction. What it means is that you're fair in your convictions and that you try to honestly understand what does someone who disagrees with your position actually think. And then also, you're just, you know, not a jerk about the way you express those convictions. Yeah, we've talked about the fact that there's multiple levels. There's a level of what you believe. That should be well sorted out, and you're allowed to hold that very strongly. The next level is what should I talk about? Then the level is, how should I talk about it? Does that make sense? So sometimes there's going to be an issue where you're going to go, I am so ferocious about this issue, I'm not a very safe person to talk to, right? <laughs> like, I get so passionate about this one, I'm, I'm probably going to agitate somebody. Then that's when you have to use some wisdom on, maybe I don't need to start that conversation. I'm a little too hot on that one. Um, and there's, but there's nothing wrong with saying, I believe God's heart is directly for this. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, good. And Pastor Lance, you did a really uh, great job of helping us see that issues are complex. Yeah. Right? 
when it comes to human reality, the, the human experience, it's, it's not black and white. Um, however, we do have scripture and, and God has his truth, mm-hmm. right? And as yes. absolute truth. So how do we blend or how do we bring absolute truth of God as revealed in scripture to these very gray areas of life? Yes. And you talked about how sometimes the scripture isn't forthcoming. Yes. Um, so can you sort of rehash a little bit that idea of application of biblical wisdom? Yeah, the Bible never is as clear as you want it to be. I mean, what you really want it to be is to spell out whatever you want to know at the time, right? That's just not how the Bible works. What we have to realize is that God is, uh, is talking in part right? I mean, God has a lot more thoughts than, than what's in Scripture. Scripture is solid. Here's my concern. My concern is people go, this is what the Bible says. The problem is they're only looking at one passage. If you look at the whole counsel of God, you realize he gives you a series of checks and balances on it. Perfect example that's not going to offend anybody here is, which I'm really, really trying to do. But anyway, One example is that if you only read one portion of scripture, it says faith without works is dead. So you automatically assume it says in God's word that if you don't work, you're not gonna be saved. We obviously know that if there's a whole nother passage that says we're saved by grace through faith alone, no works are gonna cut it. So there's a balance to that perspective. So what most people I'm concerned about is when we say I have a conviction from the Lord and the Bible is clear about it, almost always they're looking in one section. If you're only looking at New Testament and don't balance it with old, if you only look at one gospel author and don't match it with another, if you try, you know what I'm saying? There's a way to read the Bible. We need to read the Bible right in order to say what God says. Now, what I'm gonna say is he's still very gray on a lot of that. So what we do is we do what Pastor Brian was training us this evening, which is we take principles out and then you attach it through godly wisdom. If it's clear on something and there's not a lot of passages that are abundantly without any debate. That's why we have multiple denominations. That's why we've had a lot of different perspectives through the years. However, if it's read according to proper hermeneutical principles, that's the study of the Bible, it actually can be clear in the way it's trying to communicate. That is 2,000 years ago at least. So we're trying to adopt it to a modern view, which means you have to take principles from then and apply it to today. It's the only way we can handle the gray. I'm gonna tell you, the Bible walks in the gray. Because here's the last thing that I'll say on this. You're absolutely right. There is absolute truth with a capital T. Not all opinions are equal. There is God's truth, and then there is not. Here's my problem. I totally trust him, I do not trust you. In other words, be blessed. Yes, yes. In other, yeah. <laughs> be blessed. Yes. In other words, yes. God knows the answer on all those. It's not gray to Him. It's variations of how He knows how to manage it. My problem is not that God's cl- not clear. He's of course clear. My problem is us trying to understand Him from a limited perspective. That's the challenge. So yes, I believe in absolute truth. We're all chasing to hear the Lord clearest. That's what we're doing. All right. Well, we are pressed for time, so I want to uh, take time now to uh, extend some gratitude for people who've been involved in this series. So I know, Pastor Brian, you have some people on your heart that you want to thank. Yeah. So first of all, uh, thank you to all of you for for coming out. Um, Just that you care enough to to process this information, that you trust us to kind of be your guides through this process. Like I'm getting goosebumps right now. I can't tell you how meaningful that is to us, and I, and I hope we've served you well through this process. Um, our uh, tech team, under the direction of our creative arts director, Jeff Eberhardt, has just been extraordinary through this whole process. We got Brian over there, and Kirsty, Lucian, and Jeff's there in the back. We got some volunteers, Jim and Kevin on camera, uh, Hunter's back there somewhere, Josh and Connections, Courtney. I mean, so many of our staff have worked their tails off behind the scenes, and uh, we literally could not do it without them. So just want to extend appreciation to them. And then once again, for, for Anthony, for being our partner in crime Amen. throughout the whole process and really leading us in an extraordinary way. Yeah, and um, I, I just want to uh, encourage you all to... Um, Continue the conversation. As we've rehearsed over and over throughout these, this past month, is that this isn't the be-all, end-all. 
the, the recordings, the documents, they will be made available. And many of you have come to us with excitement to share this. Uh, and so that's been a really encouraging to hear that feedback that you've been blessed by it and you see that there's value in it. Um, so there's the contents that you're excited to share, but um, you've also heard the heart behind it all, right? And so we want to make sure um, and it's just encourage you that as you share the content, you also share the heart behind it because uh, they are inseparable. As Pastor Brian was saying, is that, you know, we, we poured our, our, our hearts into this, um, our, our investments of resources and time. Um, this is a labor of love. And so we just want to make sure that that labor of love gets passed on as we go. Amen. Don't, don't hurt people with the material. I mean, that, isn't that what we're trying to say? Because here's the thing we were just talking about in writing, because we're going to make available all of our notes. You get to see our notes and get to look at the, all the footnotes and all the research we did behind it. But what you don't do is just take that and hand it to somebody because on black and white paper, it can, it, you can't feel the warmth. You can't feel the love. You can't feel that when this analogy was used, it was done in a, in a smiling way. So be a peacemaker. Our job for this whole thing and our heart for all this is that we would be more unified and more healthy. Yeah. That's all I care about is I'm not going to tell you how to vote. I'm just going to tell you, please love Jesus more. Please be as healthy as you possibly can. And let's go out and care for people and, and be gentle with them. That's really what I want. So whatever we're going to do with this information, can we do that? Yep. Amen. Amen. And let's thank Pastor Brian and Pastor Lance for leading us. Oh, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have guided us through the series. Lord, we pray that you'd use it for your glory to edify the church, edify our region, to bring unity uh, in the midst of a very complex and complicated, even contentious issue of politics and how our nation is led. Lord, we pray that throughout this year that the principles that we've learned will be fresh on our mind. You bring us uh, to remembrance, Father. Uh, that way we can represent you well in this election year. So we just thank you for all that you will do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.